For those of you who are here first time, I should probably give you a little bit of background before I talk about what I'm going to be talking about. The reason why this workshop exists and you're here today is because Lance Williams, who's sitting in the back over there, and Heidi, about three years ago, two of them came to me and said, gee, we need to set up a workshop. This workshop was set up, and the question came as to where the venue should be. And I argued that it should be Los Angeles or Colorado Springs or Dave Hyland's institution at Texas A&M, who recent, they had recently built a building and were looking for people to use it and all that. Uh, and Lance and Heidi said, no, we're going to have it in Estes Park. And we went back and forth on this for a while. And eventually I said, gee, guys, we really need to decide this. And they told me, oh, it's already been decided. We've set up a thing with a Y in Estes Park. <laughs> and I said, why did you do that? And Lance said, because if no one else shows up, we want to make sure you do. <laughs> we have, <laughs> Carol and I have a summer place across the valley, is what's going on. Uh, what I want to talk about today is mock effects, and you're all probably familiar with them. OK, you all know this stuff. Standard physics, the real appeal of this in a sense, I think, is that you don't have to believe in some speculative unified field theory or some magical ideas about this or that or the other thing. It's all just straightforward physics. It's, it's reverse engineering too, I should add. You're going to hear from Lance about how problematic it is to get the mock effect equation from standard ge textbook general relativity. And we'll be looking for, I will be looking forward, and you should too, to Lance's talk on that. It turns out that's difficult. The way I did it was simply to use relativistic Newtonian gravity, which is an approximation to general relativity, and the fact that in general relativity, inertial forces are gravitational forces. That gives you the relationship between inertia and gravity that allows you to write down a gravitational field equation, ultimately with transient sources. Okay, To implement this, because I'm just a bumbling experimentalist, I'm not a theoretician of any sort, I make no claim to that, uh, you need a device that has three distinct components. One is a reaction mass, that is to say if you're going to make, make, try and make something move, you have to push off of something. That's the thing that, in effect, anchors the device gravitationally in the rest of the universe, which creates its mass, as well as the mass of the other components. The second thing you need is an actuator. This is to produce mechanical signals. Okay, The mechanical signals have to be an acceleration at some auspicious frequency, and you also need an acceleration at the second harmonic, and the phase relationship between the first and second harmonic has to be correct in order to see any effect. And then you need the device, the part of the device, where the mass actually fluctuates. To get it to fluctuate, in addition to the acceleration produced by the actuator, the energy density of the fluctuating mass needs to be changing in time in phase with the acceleration and so on and so on. Okay, In operation, actually, what we do is we use the actuator and the fluctuating mass as the same component. It's a stack of PZT crystals. And in our case, the devices that we're using, we have the extraordinary, extraordinarily good luck of blundering on to a situation with these devices where if you run them with a single frequency, you can automatically generate the second harmonic frequency that you need to produce a mechanical action to produce the thrust as electrostriction. And in the movies that I plan on showing you, you will literally be able to see this because part of the movie is the waveforms of a strain gauge which is embedded into the PZT stack as well as the voltage, the driving voltage. And you'll be able to see the second harmonic component in the mechanical part of the response. 
Okay. <coughs> That's more or less what I said there. Okay. All of this is, in fact, what I said in this slide here, so I can move on ahead. Okay. This is a schematic drawing of one of these devices. I brought one along so that I could pass it around, show and tell, and I can't find it. It's probably in my pack somewhere. You know, but my pack has a collection of junk at the bottom of the pack and I couldn't find it this morning. I will find it eventually and for those of you who are interested, you can actually handle the hardware. Okay, there are six 256 socket head cap screws, stainless, that hold the cap onto the brass mass and compress the stack. The stack needs to be compressed because if you don't compress it and you run it at high power, you'll tear it apart. Okay, the stack is comprised of two millimeter thick, 19 millimeter diameter, Steiner Martins 111 material piezoelectric discs. And the electrodes are made, actually let me show you some an electrode in a couple of the discs. Okay, the electrodes are made so that they are glued between these discs in the way shown there and all of the ones between the positive polarized faces of the discs are connected together electrically as are the ones between the negative polarized faces of the PZT discs. Running them in parallel, that means that if you apply a voltage to the stack and it's the right sign, it will make the stack expand, lengthen, and if you apply the opposite voltage, it will contract. Okay, that's a picture of, that I've already showed you. This is a collection of the actual components that go into one of these devices. The brass mass on the left, the PZT stack in the middle, and the aluminum cap on the right. You can see the connection to the strain gauge. It's the blue and yellow twisted pair that comes off the stack. And probably I should use this and point at it. Good heavens. Intense. Okay, that's the strain gauge electrode tab. This is the connection over here. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. it, adds, it puts a preload on the PZT stack. If you try and run the PZ stack, PZT stack is a free air device and you really put a lot of power into it, you'll tear it apart. Okay. Yeah. There are, a bunch of, there are a bunch of technical tricks too that I should add that have emerged in the last two, or, last two or three years because Jose in particular is on the project and Jose's, he's got a MIT aerospace and mechanical engineering degree and he's into all sorts of stuff and he allowed is how my crude version of these early devices where the stuff was machined with flat surfaces was not the right thing to do if you have preloads around, preloading screws around the outside that the surfaces that the PZT stack sits on need to be domed slightly to distribute the, distribute the stresses across the faces of these things. So all of our components are now made with domed surfaces. It's about eight, eight one thousandths, no, 0.81 thousandths of an inch doming on the... We have a world-class machinist who is, who is actually a co-I on the grant. You know, he's really outstanding. He's got an advanced degree in engineering and all that. You know, to, Did he improve so, performance? Yes, yeah, performance? yeah, yes. There's a detectable difference between doming and not doming. Yeah. No. Yes, so it's something that you want to do if you can. It's not absolutely essential, but, you know. Sorry, the dome is on uh, what piece? Uh, the, the PCT stack is a piezoelectric crystal yeah. that is very brittle because it's sintered out of uh, particles together. Oh. 
so it cannot take any tension. Yeah. So it is just like a pre-stressed concrete. And uh, where you have pre-stressed concrete, you have uh, steel. And here you have these uh, these, po these bolts, which are the screws that are actually steel. In order to pre-compress it, because it cannot take any tension. Oh. If you put enough compression, then when it goes into expansion, it's still under compression from a fourth point of view. Oh. Now, since you, we are putting a lot of compression there, it's about 3,000 pounds per square inch, you have a stress singularities at the edges. So if you look at the contact problem, when you have two flat surfaces of different materials, because they have different Poisson's ratio, the stress is not going to be uniform. So when you take that into account, you have to have a shape, just like, for example, if you make a wheel for a car out of a stone, they learn early on that you have to bevel the, the corners, otherwise you're going to, it's going to break because it's brittle. So the function of the dome is to have a uniform stress when you compress it. Okay, there are some other tricks too blundered upon by accident. Actually, a lot of this is accidental, I should say. You know, people have the idea sometimes if they're not engaged in this sort of work that you pretty much know what you're doing all the time and you <laughs> just move on forward, and that's seriously wrong, okay? There's a lot of luck involved in this. One of the lucky things was many, many years ago, I discovered that if you put a rubber pad between the thing on the right is the aluminum mounting bracket that the brass mass is bolted onto. And I discovered quite by accident, I was running these things and they were getting very hot and not showing much of any effect and all that. And then I decided, well, gee, I want to suppress vibration getting to the rest of the system anyway. So I made a rubber pad, not like the one that you see next to this, but actually one that was an annular pad. Okay, and put it between the aluminum bracket and the brass mass, and all of a sudden the thing worked beautifully. Okay, it was dramatically better. You didn't have, to, I was running the thing for 10 seconds and pulsing it at the period of the pendulum and then, then in use and all that, and just barely seeing something. And when I put the rubber pads in, you could pulse it for two or three seconds once, and we were using at the time, a laser pointer and a mirror on the suspension, uh, a filament suspension, and it made the point uh, for the reflected laser pointer two meters away from the device move by about two or three centimeters, which was dramatically better than it had been done before. I eventually discovered that you don't need the rubber pad in its entirety. All you need is little rubber pads around the screws, and so that's why you see that design there. It reduces the transfer of energy to the aluminum structure. To get these things to work right, should you ever become involved in actually trying to build these things, what you need to know is that you want to have a gizmo which has the highest possible Q and resonates like mad, and with a high Q, doesn't dissipate a lot of energy as heat, and the thing that you need to be able to do is what this rubber pad does, that is to say, to isolate the higher frequencies from the mounting structure. And there are even better ways of doing it than this, but this works. <laughs> and you're going to see some interesting movies and all that. So that's what we're doing now. Basically what we're doing with the NIAC Phase II grant is trying to make these things work as well as we possibly can and build away from them in a way that we know what we're doing as we take steps away from the system that works, okay? It's very tempting in this business to look at it and say, oh, gee, that's straightforward, and then design something and put it together and it doesn't work, and <laughs> it's, it's not a confidence builder, <laughs> okay? So that's what we're up to. This is what one of these devices actually looks like. There's heat shrink tubing on the screws so that they don't have any electrical problems with the uh, electrodes in the stack and all that. And it's, as you can see, the aluminum bracket is bolted onto this 
Actually, it's half of an aluminum project box with mu metal lining. Okay, this is what we call a Faraday cage half shell. A number of years ago, Paul, who's sitting in the front of the audience now, paying close attention, saw one of my presentations and I didn't use a Faraday cage. And he said, why didn't you use a Faraday cage? And I said, because I didn't need it. <laughs> and he said, no, you need it. No one will believe you if you don't have it in the Faraday cage. <laughs> but do you need it? Yeah, no, actually it turns out you don't need it. Okay, ah. Heidi's, going to be, Heidi's going to be telling you about some work that right at, right at what we've been doing in the last few weeks using more than one device and we have not modified the system to have a Faraday cage for multiple devices. The Faraday cage is intentionally as small as possible and as light as possible. Okay, and you can't put two devices in one of those. Okay, and it turns out when you run two devices without a Faraday cage, you do not get large electromagnetic signals that you would not expect. What you do get is some thermal effects, but she's going to tell you about that. But I suspect Paul is still right. Nobody would believe you if you didn't have the kids around. Oh, no, yes. Paul was right. There's no question about it. We wouldn't be sitting here talking about this if I hadn't used the Faraday cage that Paul said, you need that. Nobody will believe you unless you do it. Okay. All right. Uh, the thrusts the, the thrust that you measure with these things are on the order of micronewtons. And 10 or 12 years ago, when this was all being done initially, you know, micronewton level balances were simply unavailable. Uh, Martin had a, Martin's here over here. He's going to be telling you about some stuff that he's been doing in this regard. And I'm going to find out too in this presentation what he's been up to. So on, uh, you know, Martin he developed a micronewton scale balance and I think he high, he boosted the design from Andy Ket Stever, who was working at Edwards Air Force Base at the time. And he was the one who discovered this type of thrust balance, so-called flexural bearings. These are made by a corporation called C-Flex bearings, and they come in a range of sizes and sensitivities. And basically, I'm going to flip forward to three slides. Uh -huh. That's a picture of a flexural bearing. The really neat thing about these bearings is that they can carry a fairly substantial load. The bearings in use in the thrust balance suit we are using, which we found by trial and lots of error, are E10 flexural bearings, and they will carry a load of several kilograms on vertical compressive load. And the really neat thing about them is they are completely frictionless. You can see the metal blades connecting the half shells of this bearing. If you take the top and the bottom of the bearing, you can twist them relative to each other. They provide a restoring torque. And because the metal blade support blades don't touch each other in the center, there's no friction at all. So you don't have to worry about slip stick types of phenomena where if you've got a vibrating system and the vibration makes it to the center of the column of the balance, which you do everything you can reasonably do to suppress, but even if so, a little bit of vibration might make it to the center column, you don't have to worry about these bearings moving a little bit and locking up and moving a little more and locking up and so on. Okay. Look at where they are in the center, Heidi. In the center, they're not touching. Right there is where you want to be looking. That, no, 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 yeah, no, I know. They, no, seriously, these are amazing. You know, and they're cheap. They're about 50 bucks a piece. And they're very tiny as well. They're yeah, they're real small. <laughs> E10s? E10s, yes. E10s. E10s are the ideal, ideal bearings for this sort of work. Okay, it's produced a th thrust balance. Let me go back and show you the other slides. It's produced a thrust balance. This is a schematic of how it works that has, in our present circumstances, tenth of a micronewton noise level. Okay, 
It's really amazing. And it's because the lab got moved and we've got a much better isolation system going. We've got this thing mounted on a block of 500 pounds of granite standing on four piers with pneumatic devices inside that you can make to reduce the vibration. But if you do, the whole thing floats and wobbles and all that at low frequency and just makes it impossible to zero the balance. Heidi figured out how to stop all that by simply deflating the pneumatic parts and now the balance, the granite block just sits on the piers and it works beautifully. Perhaps uh, this uh, is something that should be addressed toward the talk because the, the use of the word bearing that you didn't come up with here uh, maybe uh, giving the wrong impression to the public because uh, as I understand this, the flexural bearings is like you pointed out is the middle thing that is acting with this very thin membrane uh -huh. that is yeah. bending these things. Yeah. And, and that's what gives you the torsional stiffness. Yes. Now you can only use it for, as I understand. For very small displacements. For a very small angle. Yes. Can, it's not a bearing in the sense that you can continue. Continuous rotation is not possible. There is yeah. no stator uh, right. and a rotating yeah. device. Yeah. So maybe I, should, I wouldn't call it a bearing because it gives the wrong image to people that they think, oh, this is... No, I, 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 say I will be sure to, if I talk about this at, at uh, Boston, I will be sure to point that out, that these things can be rotated slightly, but the total angle of displacement is at most a few degrees. It's more of a pivot surface. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it, it, yes, Greg, that's right. But my problem is, is the name of the company is C-Flex Bearings. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, would just, I would just stress the flex. Because that's the the flex. flex. Yes, I will stress the flex. Okay, good point. Anyway, this is what the balance looks like. Uh, on the right-hand side, that box is a completed Faraday cage that the device sits in. Okay, and... The beam has just inboard from that. Oh, wait a second. Here's a button. Just inboard from that. Those are 35 millimeter film canister caps wound with 10 turns of wire. And they're set up so that you can calibrate the balance knowing this. Heidi actually. The you mentioned this thing about magnetic field. Do you, would you perform better if the magnetic field is larger or smaller? Or we're going to get to magnetic fields when I show you the movies, right after I show you the movies. Okay, one of the tests that is very easy to do that simply wipes out one of the major problems that could potentially beset these devices is magnetic fields. In the so, kind of so we got a, so we got, Heidi went and got from the text a stack of neodymium boron magnets that produces a field a hundred times the ambient field at the device, and all it does is damp the motion of the beam. I guess, I guess I'm curious, as the magnetic field goes up, the temperature is going to go up, and also by this dome shape, I'm wondering if that would cause thermal effects <laughs> to increase also. Thermal, thermal effects in these devices, as Heidi's going to show you, as a matter of fact, because thermal effects do not get suppressed when you take it out of the Faraday cage. One of the unintended consequences of your Faraday cage is that it strongly suppresses thermal effects in the device because the thermal effects are all in the power wiring to the PCT stack. The PCT stacks by themselves don't heat up appreciably at all. Almost all of the thermal effects in it is the 24 gauge stranded copper wires between the plug from the power thing that go to the device are about three inches long. Okay, you take it out, of, well, you'll see. Okay, uh, all right, let me just quickly go through the rest of it. This is a central column, I'll say more about that later. This is over here, a beam, beam support so that you can lock the beam while you're doing stuff with the Faraday cage and stuff, you know. And if you forget, it's not the end of the world because the flex, flexural bearings are much more robust than you might imagine them to be. Uh, this is a damper. Here, it's a bunch of neodymium boron magnets embedded in the plastic thing that's here. And then you have the metal blades, aluminum blades on either side. 
than it's in any current damping system. And by trial and error, we got the damping to be just slightly subcritical, okay? So that the balance has a settling time of about five seconds. But you can still see transient effects. The transient effects are not completely damped out either by the inertia of the balance because it's designed to be as light as possible or by uh, the damper. Okay, over here, this is a stepper motor arrangement. There's an optical probe that's mounted on that and you can use a stepper motor to adjust the distance of the probe from the reflector and you can't see the reflector because it's back up under there and then the counterpoise weights above on the beam. Okay, so that's it. So Jim, just, just one a simple question. Sure. Uh, for eddy current damping, is the magnet sitting on the balance arm or on the supporting structure? They are, they are stationary on the, on the support platform. The metal blades are the things that move when the balance is displaced. This is very bad. Uh, so, so <laughs> We found this as well. It's okay. if, if, if you produce some magnetic fields, then on your thrust device, that will severely interact with the permanent magnet even a supporting structure. Yeah, but, you can, yeah, but there's an easy way to, to eliminate that, Mark. All you have to do is reverse the direction of the device on the other end of the beam in the Faraday cage. The sort of thing that you're talking about, the electromagnetic fields in this thing are primarily from these, notwithstanding that they're shielded, those are the power leads, okay? And they don't change when you reverse the direction of the device. It's, it's also true you could just put up a pair of Hemholtz coils in, in a well-equipped lab and uh, zero out the Earth's magnetic field entirely. John's you get rid of all that by just reversing the order. So put the sure, magnets sure. on the, the magnets balance. on the this beam and put the metal blades on the, on the platform. Yes, that's something that we can do. It's a relatively easy thing to do, and you know, for other reasons, I'm not concerned that it will all of a sudden say, "Oh, gee, all the stuff you've been doing for the last ten years is wrong." Okay, I'm not worried about. It. Okay. Okay. Since, uh, in order to understand, since I have both uh, you and Martin talking about this, from what you just said, Jim, I understand that the damping ratio for this device is near one. What is the damping ratio that is being used at, uh, by Martin in uh, Dresden? 0 0.403. You don't zero, want zero to point four three. Three. Sorry? Four three. 0 0.43. Okay. So it's, uh, it, what is the reason why you're using 0 0.43? We don't want to go above 0.7. Because? Because if you go higher, yeah. I mean, the point three is if you increase the damping afterwards, you just prevent resonating of the balance with an external force. So you can see the period. Yeah. Right. That's why we have it under yeah. the side. Okay. Ours is not 1.0, it's less than 1.0. Yeah. Because it's less than 1.0. You can see uh -huh. transients and watch them settle. But do we know whether it is 0 0.8, 0 0.7? No, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Just watch the decay. It's, 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 the, the thing has been tuned so that you can, you'll see in the movies, the thing has been tuned so that you can see the important stuff. And it's less, it's less than 1.0 damping. Okay, you'll see the transient and then you'll see, come back from the transient and continue, you know, at the, yeah, okay, and so on. Okay, the really neat thing about this, which oh, I, I know, yes. What is the, the natural frequency of your balance at this point? Heidi, because you were the one who, who took the damper out. That's just, uh, six seconds. Uh, six seconds. Uh, 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 Basically, I took the magnets out completely, and uh, there was an earthquake going on, so I was just going to take the earthquake. <laughs> so I just got the natural oscillation, it was, it was about six seconds. I actually mapped it with mathematics, it was about perfect, and I know exactly what the point would have We had the experiment working perfectly in the earthquake. <laughs> this, as I say, the settling time is about five seconds. Okay? If you do something, five seconds later, it's where the balance will basically be, unless you do something else.
Okay, you'll see this. Another reason why you only show <coughs> Yes, the shortest, when doing pulses at constant frequency, the shortest time interval is eight seconds, so that you know what it's settled to. And some of them are done at 10, 12, and 14 seconds, just to make sure that we convince skeptics that you know, there's not something hidden that shows up as a little bit, and then it says something else. Okay. Jim, uh, maybe I, I've been asleep for a couple of years and I've seen what you're doing. I understand the fluctuations, but now you're mentioning resonance. What do we, what kind of effects are we getting with this resonance? What is it? Is it vibrational? In order, to, to, you, well, it's vibrational in that you're driving a, an electromechanical device. So you you're driving a PZT. You want to make the PZT stack move as much as you can because that's the accelerations that you need in order to produce the effect. And also the accelerations at the second harmonic that you need to change the mass fluctuation into a thrust. Okay? It turns out with these devices, quite by accident, what we found is that the principal mechanical resonance of the devices we're using is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 30 kilohertz. Uh, it depends a little bit on the on the um, matching circuit that's used for the power system. If the power system has, you can shift the principal mechanical resonance slightly with the matching circuit. But the matching circuit also has electrical resonances off the mechanical resonance of the device, which will make the device move a lot more than it would anywhere else on the curve. And those mechanical resonances that are off the principal mechanical resonance turn out to have the right phase with the electrostructive response. Now, years ago, you used to have equations that has got nothing to do with your equations. What the resonance doesn't fit into those. No, no, the, the resonance. The resonance is just there to make the mechanical system work the way to optimize the mechanical response to produce the effects that you're interested. Are you damping this out so you eliminate this uh, resonance? What, the mechanical resonance? Yeah. If you're running off the mechanical resonance and you're running on an electrical resonance, you don't have to worry about the mechanical resonance other than as a sideband of something. You know, wait until I get to the movies. You'll see what I'm talking about. Well, I guess the other question I have is, if I hit these resonance, will I get more thrust? If you don't use if the, I hit the resonance. If you, if you hit the mechanical resonance on these devices in this system, you do not get thrust. If you're slightly off resonance, you can produce switching transients, okay, that produce the effect that you want. Ultimately, the way these things will get implemented is using switching transients that are predicted by the theory because it gives you a very low duty cycle. You don't have to worry about heating the thing up as much. Okay, all right. This is, this is a part of the thrust balance for those of you who might be thinking about going into the business that you'll really want to take into consideration. These are liquid metal contacts for the power circuit. This is an innovation that I introduced after trying all sorts of hard wire solutions and being frustrated by them. And it's a design feature that is now being used commonly, as far as I can tell, in the business. Okay, so you want liquid metal contacts for the power circuit. Okay, you've seen that. This is a picture of the half shell with a device in it in the process of being put into the Faraday cage. The thing to notice here, which is more prominent than this next slide, is this red plastic structure here that goes around it. That's part of the vibration damping system. The parts, the aluminum and plastic parts, are held together with 440 screws with little itty bitty O-rings in them as a vibration damping thing. But the main reason for it is this nut right here. All you have to do is loosen it up and you can just simply rotate the thing on the end of the speed. One of the principal tests in this is reversing the direction of the device and seeing whether or not you get the same signal. If you get the same signal, you aren't looking at what you want. If the signal reverses, you are. Okay. What is the material which is the aluminum bracket is uh, attached to, which is black or dark? 
What, this thing here? Yes. What is that black or dark material? Uh, the black or dark material is actually empty space. Let me this. see. Here's one of the 440 screws. I mean this. What, what is this? Material? Oh, that's translucent red plastic, which I like to use everywhere I can. <laughs> okay. It's plastic. It's simple, you know. Yeah. Why not use aluminum instead of the plastic? Because aluminum, aluminum is a little bit more massive than the plastic. But the main reason why is that the plastic is a damper of vibration, okay? As well as the O-rings that hold the thing together. You know, the efforts that we have made to make sure that vibration doesn't make it to the central column where you can get problems if your C-flex bearings aren't working right, you know, uh, are everywhere there's an opportunity to damp vibration, we damp it, okay? Uh, what, what plastic is this? Is it a thermal plastic? Is it, you know? It's just plain old you know, acrylic plastic. It's what you, if you go into a plastic supply place and say, give me a sheet of eight inch thick translucent red plastic, they go and cut a piece to the size. Why didn't you use rubber uh, that? Why didn't you use a rubber sheet? Oh, the rubber, the rubber in this, is in this structure are the O-rings. If you look very carefully under the head of that 440 screw, you'll see a washer and an O-ring. There's an O-ring on the other side. Between Why did you use rubber for the red instead of the red line? Because it has to be a sufficiently rigid structure to carry the weight and all of that of the uh, Faraday cage and device. Okay. It's actually in the structural part of the system, so what is not okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. Let's see. Um, but that not makes it possible to, as I say, report supplies. This is a big Sorry, uh, Jim. Equally important to flip in the thrust direction is uh, to make also 90 degrees, which give us yeah, a zero signal. The right? 90 degree test Martin, is in chapter five in the book. Okay, we've done that test, or I should say, I did that test years ago, and at the time it was running on a balance where there was a non-reversing thrust that showed up in the vertical direction as well. But it's the same for up and down. So if you subtract up from down to see if there's any net thrust being driven to the beam, you know, it says no, that's not a consequence of that. So the 90 degree test has been done. We have been increased. I just think it's important to run this for every test, right? every thruster that's essential yeah. to have a zero uh, measurement always. Yeah. What you find, what you find, one of the reasons why we don't do it more than this because we are now in circumstances where when you subtract one from reverse, you get a signal. But if you sum the two to see what doesn't reverse with the device, you get zero. There's nothing there. Okay. Now, yes, we can throw in the 90 degrees. Yes. Okay. John. Uh, <coughs> on the previous slide, uh, on the, with the pivot uh, on the Faraday cage, how does the power get in? Ah, previous slide. Where does the power go? Okay, what you can see here, way up here in the upper corner, all of that shielded stuff going down into the aluminum channel that is the balance beam, that's the power circuit. The power leads run through the aluminum balance beam here, and the power lead is coming out right there it traverses a distance of about a... So you disconnect that, then you flip the thing over, and then you reconnect it or something? No, you don't even have to disconnect the power at all. You just loosen the nut and rotate it. <coughs> or if you want to, you can do what Martin did with his test. We did it just to check and make sure. You can leave it all that way, open up the box, and reverse the direction of the device simply by loosening that nut inside the box. Okay. Martin had a really good reason for doing this because he had an enormous box and he had stuff lying around in the box. Okay, this is much more compact, but we did it just to make sure that it would meet that test as well. 
Okay, and I got movies of all this stuff. If you're really interested, I can, if I can remember which folder I put them in. <laughs> I'm still not getting the touch. You said, how do you reverse the This piece of plastic across here, okay, is single point contact on the end of the beam here by this thing here. There's a threaded piece of tubing that goes into the end of the beam and the power lead comes through that threaded piece of tubing and that's the power lead right there. The white, it's 25 kilovolt insulation, uh, <coughs> stranded copper wire, okay. And this is the end of the threaded piece of the tube. So if you just simply loosen that nut, then that red piece of plastic is free to rotate on the end of the beam. And all you have to do is rotate it 180 degrees, tighten the nut back down, and you're ready to go. So actually, you have to disconnect the thermistor, which measures the temperature of the cap, and the, uh, and the strain gauge connections when you do this flip, because it tangles the wires up when you, when you rotate it. You know, but that's not consequential. You're talking about minor effects that might be present in those. Okay. Uh, one more question, please. Um, yes. Last year when we visited your lab, you had a few cables coming right from the balance itself without any liquid contacts. And I think it was the thermistor cables and uh, the accelerometer cables, the, the small ones. Yes. Are this still the case? Is this still the case? Yeah, these two guys here. Yes. Exactly, and that. Those have to be disconnected. You have to disconnect them. No, no, no. I mean, right from the balance itself to outside. Oh, yeah. The, the thing. Yeah, no, that's, that's taken out in a bundle of instrumentation leads over here, right next to the central column. And it's not obvious in this picture. Let's see if it's obvious in any of the previous pictures. But they don't want to do liquid metal contacts. Is that what yeah, that's good. All right, you can here, right there, that's the instrumentation leads. And the power leads to the calibration coil are in that bunch of wires there. But isn't this a problem? I mean, no, they are still it isn't. It, it, what, it, what it should be is something that contributes slightly to the uh, torque when you move the beam because you're winding them up or not winding them up a little bit, okay? And it's an asymmetric effect in that case. It's not like the flexural bearings. And what you find is forward and reverse basically turn out to be the same. So this way of taking out your instrumentation leads works okay. We've got a new, new design for the central column and all that, which is going to have main electrical, main liquid metal contacts for the power circuit, but we've put in enough space so that we can add a bunch of small liquid metal contacts for the instrumentation as well. Yes, but it, that is not a problem as far as the results that you get with this thing. Okay, now back to, ah, there's a picture of the, oops, wrong one. There's a picture of the device in its vacuum chamber. It's a one foot diameter piece of uh, plex, half inch thick wall, uh, 30 inches long. And it just sits in there. The end plates are made of bulletproof ac acrylic, which was an overrun from some job and I got a surplus. It works beautifully. You know. uh, as a matter of fact, you can see there are a whole bunch of studs there that you can bolt it down with if you want to. We don't even bother with that. We just Pressure on the plate seals the chamber very nicely. Do the chamber and the balance grounded separately so that there's no electrostatic buildup on the inside the plastic? The balance, the balance is grounded and, let's see, the earlier slides are not going to be much help on this. The balance itself is grounded and the device is separately grounded so that you get a current signal that you can use to get the power by taking the product of the current and the voltage. 
okay, which we haven't implemented yet because I haven't finished building <laughs> a, a two-channel power meter and all that. Uh, but in any event, this thing here, the central column, and all of the metal parts are grounded, okay? But none of the plastic is grounded. How about the, uh, the vacuum chamber itself? The vacuum chamber itself, there's, there really isn't much point of grounding it because if you do develop electrostatic charges anywhere on the surfaces, they will not flow to ground. It's a non-conductor. It's a dielectric, okay? What we find, what you find with these things is when you initially build them, you can build up electrostatic charges in various parts of the device, and you have to use a grounding cloth, or you have to wait, basically, several days for the stuff to dissipate. But it turns out not to be a problem in routine use. Thank you. Okay. Is there a reason not to use an aluminum vessel instead of a plastic vessel? Yeah, I like to be able to see what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I, I, I know, it's idiosyncratic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Remember, remember, you're talking about a project which is in transition from an out-of-pocket, mostly, you know. Having been bitten by electric charges building up on plastic, I really don't like plastic. No, plastic. I, I, under, I understand, John. There is this stuff that when, they, when you buy electronics and they send it in the mail, it comes in one of these old transparent, yes. transparent packages. Yes, plastic that it's conductive. conductive. It's you think about winding this thing or something like that. Yeah, no, it, it turns out not to be a problem. This is addressed in Chapter 5, by the way, <laughs> okay, because it was something that we considered, you know, putting the thing close to the plastic as opposed to in its central position and things like that. Yes, uh, but no, really, it's basically partly because this was the cheapest solution and it was partly because I like to be able to see what's going on. If you've got a loose wire, it's real easy to see. If you have a loose wire and a steel chamber, yeah, you, know, you got a real, you, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> I can tell you for being on a rather intense experiment, where we could see nothing. It was a can, and we were, I, I was used to having a big portal where I could see everything, and the, um, <coughs> the charge of this experiment even, they were reproducing my experiment, insisted on putting it in as small a vacuum vessel as possible, which had no windows on it, <laughs> and just a camera. And it was absolutely crippling to the experiment because we couldn't see what was going on. We had no situational awareness, <laughs> Okay, all right. Data were recorded with a couple of picoscopes, okay? And the an earlier version of this uh, was recorded by an analog to digital converter card, a Kinetics 2100. Uh, the Kinetics 2100 card is still in use, but not for data acquisition. It produces an analog digital, analog to digital signal which switches the power relay and another one which runs the uh, VCO control voltage so that you can do frequency modulated sweeps. Okay? I so, have a question about the file tech. Uh, what mode do you run it in? It has a fine, a medium, rough mode. The finest mode is slower. And then what mode do you run, run it in? Um, the, the two nanometer resolution mode or the 23 uh, nanometer you're talking, you're talking about the FilTech optical probe. I'm just curious. Yes. Yeah, go. we're not using their proprietary software with the high, how should I put it, integration times. Basically what they do is they get the very, very high sensitivity simply by increasing the integration time for the signal, averaging it for a longer period of time, which is very slow. Okay, and then you can run it in lesser modes. When we my laser displacement sensor literally has a switch for the Yes, modes. yes, but you, yeah, we are not using modes for the reason that I will now tell you. When Tom Hood bought the Pico Scope, 1100 bucks, 10 or 12, 13 years ago, to use with the balance and it's still in use, he decided that what we were going to be looking at would be so big that we did not need their high resolution mode and all that. So he didn't buy the electronics. And when it became clear that that was unacceptable, I designed and built the electronics to do 
what their electronics for a lot of money does. Okay? And the circuit that does that is basically one which takes the almost 5 volt signal that comes out of the Filtech probe being very close to the mirror and it reduces it down to zero by putting in a 5 volt comparison voltage and then subtracting it using an instrumentation amplifier. And that signal is then amplified and filtered. Okay, and the amplification, if my recollection serves, it's on the order of somewhere between 500 and 1,000, and the filters on it are half hertz. There's a, actually, there's a 10 hertz filter followed by a half hertz filter, uh, which are just VCVS implementation. How many samples per second are you taking? But the Filtech takes thousands of samples per second. Uh, when it was running... Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, when when this was running on the kinetics board, the sampling rate was a hundred a hundred hertz. So okay. Oh. Now now with the Pico scopes, it's like two kilohertz, three kilohertz, something like that. You can adjust it by the telling it how many samples they integrate right. so on this. Less than the operating frequency of the device, because the device operates thirty six kilohertz, and you're sampling at two hundred hertz. No, you're sampling at about two kilohertz. Two kilohertz. Okay. Yeah. Actually, our device only works at 20 kilohertz. It doesn't go up to 36. It doesn't go as fast as that. That was one of the problems I had when I was trying to use it with a thermal That was a question I prepared for before this, so thank you very much. Okay. All right. Just another question, sorry. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, so when you have your own kind of amplifier being built with the field tag, um, did you do calibration runs to really be sure that you can mesh down to, let's say, this 0.1 magnitude yeah. is really accurate? Wait till you see the movies, Mark. I will speed up a bit. Okay. Two run protocols were used. Okay. A search protocol, which starts out, you select some frequency of which you think you have, might have something interesting. You do a pulse for two or three seconds at that frequency. And that is separated by a sweep uh, that can be adjusted. Most of them were done over eight seconds, 30 kilohertz swept over eight seconds, followed by another center frequency pulse of a few seconds. Okay, in the movie you will see the sweep is actually 24 kilohertz over 12 seconds, so it's two kilohertz per second. Okay. I got a question. Yes. Yes. Are your frequencies continuous as you're sweeping? Yes. Discontinuous. Yes. It's, it's an analog. Frequency. It's an it's an analog VC, VCO signal okay. generator. Okay. It's in fact an Elenco functions box, <coughs> a little thing that came on a you know, card and built up and all that. Sure. And the electronics look homemade, but they actually work the way they're supposed to. Okay. <coughs> all right. Sorry. What is the rate of frequency changing? <laughs> The sweeps that we normally do are 30 kilohertz in eight seconds, so it's what three is three point something kilohertz per second. But the one I'm going to show you is two kilohertz per second for 12 seconds. Okay. All right. Then the other protocol we used is once we found a frequency of which we expected to see a reasonable effect and all that. She's given me another half hour. <laughs> <laughs> then it's going to make some ugly noise. Okay, that includes questions. Questions are as we're going along, I think, so we don't have to worry too much about questions at the end. Okay, this is just simply picking a frequency and turning the thing on for some length of time longer than five seconds. If we were just interested in seeing what it was without worrying about skeptics coming along and saying, oh, you only did it for eight seconds. What happens at longer times? The one that I'm going to show you is a 12-second pulse, okay? And you'll be able to see very clearly what I'm talking about, about the response of the thing. Actually, there was a third protocol used called chirping. This is something that's aimed at actual practical implementation. It turns out that the on and off transients that are predicted by theory are, in some cases, larger than the constant frequency pulses. 
And since at that time we were worried about heating of the devices, transients are obviously the thing to do. Okay. We have recently discovered that the heating of our system was primarily in the power cable, which is in close proximity to the aluminum cap in the system that you've seen, and the power cable was heating up the cap. When Heidi started doing runs with two devices which didn't have a Faraday cage, and the power cables, as a result, weren't near the aluminum caps, the heating went away, but the thermal effects showed up. Okay, before I show you the movies, however, I'm going to mention quickly phase one work is mentioned below. The <coughs> switching transient approach was used to do voltage scaling, and that's the reason why it's there. Okay, now we get to the movies. This is the first movie that I'm going to show you. This is one of those sweeps that I was telling you about. You can see 3-12-24-3. And then there's 8.30, that's the date. Okay, so it's 3.12.3 with a 24 kilohertz sweep. Okay, here we go. What is the date on this sweep? August 30th. Very recently. Very recently. Here we go. Well, on the left, those are the waveforms. Blue is the voltage. Red is the strain gauge. On the right is the strip chart recording of what you're looking at. And when we get done with the powered interval on this, I'll stop it and then explain what the various parts are. And if you want to see it again, I can run it again for you. Okay. This is a confusing trace until you know which colors goes with what, and I apologize for that. I realize that if you're doing a presentation in front of a bunch of people, you don't want to have more than two traces as a general rule, okay, because they're confusing. Movies will not be part of the talk two weeks from now. Okay, now I need the right instrument here, John's laser pointer. Okay, the red trace is the thrust, and as you can see, it bounces around like that. The, the scale factor for this is 160 millivolts per micronewton. And on this particular trace, since it's one volt full scale, that means you're looking at full scale 6.25 micronewtons. Okay, so that gives you a sense of how large these things are. It bounces around here with noise level in the order of a tenth, maybe two tenths of a micronewton at the very most. Okay, and then you get the signal when you turn on the device, when you turn on the device, you get a sharp transient and it bounces back and all that. That doesn't always occur, but here you've got the switching transient produced by turning it on first. Okay, since the pulse is only three seconds long, it's not long enough for it to settle. So it starts back, but it doesn't settle to a particular value. You get an off switching transient when you change the frequency. At this point there, the frequency gets changed from 36 kilohertz to 48 kilohertz, and then sweeps down through the 36 kilohertz to 24 kilohertz. It's a 24 kilohertz sweep, and you see the off switching transient when the frequency changes. There's a small resonance here at about 40 kilohertz, and you can see a little bit of a dip there. The principal resonance is halfway between these two pulses, right about here, and there you see the large negative dip as it sweeps the main resonance at 36 kilohertz. The mechanical resonance is not there. The mechanical resonance is this thing, this brown trace, which is a strain gauge signal, and it turns out to be at about 31 kilohertz, right here, something that Martin should be familiar with. <laughs> So this is, in fact, the device that we sent to Martin to test, <laughs> which was returned with obvious signs of a serious thermal event. <laughs> but believe it or not, not, notwithstanding a large thermal event, the thing still works. It doesn't work as good as it did at one time, but, but it still works. Okay, so as you can see here at the mechanical resonance, 
there's no thrust. Things vibrating like mad, but there's no thrust. Okay, which is a clear indicator that simply vibra having a vibrating system does not produce a response if you do this right. It starts drifting down as the frequency continues on down to 24 kilohertz. And then when it gets switched back to 36 kilohertz, right here, you see the large transient, switching transient on. The trace continues on up, and when it's turned off, you get an off switching transient. And the off switching transient from the second central fault produces a signal on the order of three or four micronewtons. Okay, yes? Uh, you have a transformer after your amplifier. Yes. That's we sent you one. <laughs> you didn't use it. And it's my fault because I did not explain all of the stuff that I've been explaining here this morning. But you're using the same right? It's the same transformer as you still have. And what is it? Because it's a four to one step up transformer on an Amidon Associates FT ferrite torus, 140, 1.4 inches in diameter, dash 77 ferrite material. Okay. And it's got 10 turn primary and a 40 turn secondary. Okay. okay? Well, we didn't get this one, actually. You did actually, yeah, yes, you did. It's a little itty bitty one. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. If you don't have one, we'll provide you with another one. <laughs> okay? It's a matching transfer. Providing them with another thruster, however. Uh, that, <laughs> providing them with another thruster is going to await us perfecting making these things consistently so that they work right. Okay, we're still sorting that out. We've isolated the main problem, and the main problem is, believe it or not, the blue, okay, and the way it's cured. <laughs> and we're, we're working through that now. As a matter of fact, after this workshop, I plan on spending the time here between now and Boston making some more stacks. <laughs> We okay. Sort of knew parameter space. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> we sort of knew about the parameter space before, but we didn't. We did not fully appreciate how important the curing of the glue is. You also, okay. said, you also said that the stack doesn't heat up, but you have yeah. to measure temperature only on the aluminum mass. So how would you yeah, I know, but it's an amazingly quick response. You know, and literally, the, the heating signature. You can see the the thermal signature is is here, it's this purple line. You can see there's a little bit of heating during the first thing. You get here to the main resonance, there's a little bit of heating. When you hit the mechanical resonance, it goes way up very fast, okay? This is the thermal response right here, that step the function. Going through the PVC. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the, it, the, the, the metal, the metal, it's metal, the metal. But the ceramic is a terrible conductor. So you Stainless is not a good. No, this is. It's, it's in close contact with the metal, and the metal just saps the. Heat not out. close contact if it's in the center. Of the heat. What you, what you, the important thing you, to take away from this is that the heating actually isn't nearly as bad as we have believed for the last X years, you know, because we've been running the thing with the power leads right next to the device inside the Faraday cage, and it was inductively heating the cap, the power leads, okay? And so we're seeing these big thermal events. What you can take as real in this is not the heating generally that you see, that step function, that's sweeping the mechanical resonance, and that's real heating of the device, okay? Yes, David. What is the delta temperature you're observing here? The delta, t oh God, do you remember the thermal scale for these things? It's, it's actually quite complicated. It's like a, she has a calibration curve posted in the lab. So, uh, I think somewhere on my computer, in fact, that computer, I do have calibrated curves and temperatures, so I could probably look it up. It's on the order, it's on the, it's, it's much less, it's much less than 100 degrees C, even if you do it wrong the way we have, with the wires right next to the aluminum cap. Certainly, the ceramic, you know, does, is a four-heat conductor. But we're seeing the thermal signature, even if we're not measuring, you know, in, in an absolute sense. We're seeing the thermal uh, behavior. Okay. Now, what I'm going to 
All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this thing run out, and then I'm going to run it again for you. Wait a second. Here we go. <laughs> Keypad always works. Okay, as you can see, again, this is noise after the event, and it's also a clear indication that all of that mechanical stuff that happened in between did not change the zero. Okay, so there's no slip stick sort of thing going on in any of that mechanical stuff. Okay, now what I'm, it's, in its few seconds it will say play again and I will, and the thing to watch is the panel on the left, which is the actual waveforms as this all goes through. And yes? What is the voltage you are driving the thruster there? That's, that, that's a peak amplitude of about 250 volts. And what's the current in the thruster or the power? The current, the, the current is what you would expect with a capacitance of 19 nanofarads. The device stacks have a capacitance of 19 nanofarads. So it it's a few amplifiers. Current spikes. Uh, we, didn't, we did not measure the current because I haven't finished making the power meter yet. <laughs> it's a low priority item. There's higher priority items that take precedence and so forth. But we will eventually. Eventually what we'll be doing is we'll be measuring the power in real time with a four quadrant multiplier of the current and the voltage. You're and asking um, your voltage on the right. It looks yes. like if it's near the resonance, the voltage is not a side anymore. It looks more like a square or that's completely different stuff. So shouldn't it indicate that you are amplified? Wait a second. You're going to get to see the voltage waveform, the actual waveform of the voltage, so you can answer your question. Here we go. Again, watch the voltage waveform. It's the blue one on the left. Okay, and it's one volt per hundred volt scale. Watch the red waveform, that's the end. That's the strain gauge embedded in the stack. And notice that it's not a simple sine wave, that there are higher harmonic components. But you okay. the sine, it's not the sine. Yeah, the sine is pretty close to, it gets some back reaction from the PZT stack because the sensor is between the isolation transformer and the device, okay? And the mechanical action produces a voltage that is also picked up by the sensor. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm, uh, yes, yes, Martin. Two questions. First one is, um, before such kind of test runs, do you calibrate the balance before and after the test that you're sure that do we do calibration runs before and after every run? No, <laughs> we don't do calibration. The, the system is remarkably stable. You know, if we do occasional calibration. We've got a, those coils that are set up as the calibration coils. Every now and then if we suspect something screwy with the balance, we'll use them, then we will power that circuit and we know how much voltage or actually how many amps through those coils should correspond to what deflection sure, for... But did you test linear error that you can really see that, that you can really see 0.1 micro Do you command on your coils 0.1 micro and be able to see the deflection at that level? You can see at the level of less than a micro Newton with the calibration coils, yes. Now, you're not running a lot of current through them, but you can see it. And you can, you can literally see, as we'll get to with the test with the neodymium boron magnets with the large field, that its principal effect on the device is not on the power circuit or anything like that, which are all heavily shielded. What it does is it acts as a damper. It produces eddy currents in the balance beam in the Faraday cage and reduces the amplitude of the signal. But let me show you the pulse signal first, and then we'll get to those tests so you can... No, and just my, my second question would be, yes. um, the thrust appears not at the mechanical resonance. That's um, right. Why? Because, because the second harmonic is not in the correct phase relationship to the first harmonic. But the amplitude is dramatically reduced by yes. the mechanical resonance. I know, but if you're not at the mechanical resonance, and you run it 
with the appropriate step up stuff and all of that, you can make it resonate, okay? If you look, here, wait a second, wrong implement. It's not easy to see, but at 36 kilohertz over here, that's the resonance that you're looking at there. The fuzz in the blue trace, that's the voltage trace. That means it's sweeping the resonance and you're getting big signals. And what you get in the strain gauge is that fuzz in the brown trace. So you're not running off resonance and not producing any mechanical response. The mechanical response, the brown trace is down here coming in and then it goes up and you get the fuzz as you sweep the resonance and so on. Is the resonance you're talking about where you have a boost in the voltage or the opposite? Yes, 36 kilohertz. You're going to be able to see this in another movie, but you won't see, you'll see it in the voltage trace. In that movie, it, all the other stuff except the thrust are suppressed. And we'll get to that in a second. Two more movies. This one is a simple pulse. Okay, this is at 36.3 kilohertz is right on that resonance that we were talking about, okay, which is not the principal mechanical resonance. Okay, here we go. What you're going to see is a switching transient as it's turned on, followed by steady thrust. And when it gets turned off, you'll see a switching transient to go back to zero. There it is at the settling time, and it's keeping on running. And there's the off transient. And you'll see that this comes back up to the same zero level. Okay, steady thrust. The physics of this is that in a system of this sort, that can only appear if there are mass fluctuations, okay? Otherwise, what you're looking at is something that the center of mass of the system has to stay the same because of the conservation of momentum. If the parts move around the center of mass, you can, in principle, produce small transients in the beam because it being displaced a little bit, goes out, comes back, and settles back at its zero spot. It does not do what you're looking at here. That is to say, produce this steady thrust. Okay. And we got lots of movies like this. This is a pretty one. There are some ones that are a lot uglier, but the, the effect is the same. Okay. So, without... I didn't bring the... I did not bring in this folder that movies of that long range. That would be very convincing. Oh, what? I can, I, I, will, I, I will go looking after we get done in my folder for one of those movies. And, you know, if somebody has 10 minutes in between talks or something like that, I'll, I'll be happy to show it to you. Yeah, it just, it just up, it inverts the whole thing. Yep. Yeah. Yes. And that does indeed occur. And whenever we're doing these types of runs, we do as many of those as of the, this is what we call the forward direction. We do as many reverse direction and then subtract them to suppress common mode signals. Okay, now Heidi, come back. You need to get me back to the movie folder. Huh? Wait a second, wait a, no, 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 don't do it yet. No, I wanna. I want to, yeah, I'm, here, let me run it for you again. Now you just look at it right there. As the temperature is going up, the thrust is going up as well. Is that right? <laughs> no, the temperature, the temperature act. <laughs> this is a temperature curve up here. Yeah. Yes, and indeed it's going up, but it's not going up because the stack is heating up. This is what we discovered was due to the placement of the power like cables in the Faraday cage. The temperature of the actual stack goes up almost imperceptibly, as Heidi will show you. Okay, these things don't heat up nearly as much as we thought they did. Okay, is the thrust going up? The voltage actually is going down a little bit, and the thrust is drifting a little bit because there's a small thermal effect. It's probably a buoyancy effect of the heating up of the power leads inside the box. And yes, we're going to work on 
the power leads doing it in a more elegant way so that it doesn't do this stuff. But you're looking at 10% or less effects as compared with the actual thrust signal. Okay, You're looking at a little bit of thermal drift here that's being produced by that thermal signal that you see there. But it's the heating of the Faraday cage, it's not the heating of the device that's doing it. Okay. Uh, okay, one more time, watch the waveforms. That tells you what physically is going on. Notice the blue one is a nice <laughs> vibrating sine wave, <laughs> and the red one is not. The red one has obvious higher harmonic content. Okay, and now I'm going to stop this and I'm going to call Heidi back and I'm going to show you one more movie. This movie was done a year ago. It was done before the work on the, uh, on the voltage scaling. Voltage scaling test, by the way, shows that this scales cortically. Nick Herbert, who's on my email list, suggested he looked at all this stuff and he said, hey, this thing should scale as the fourth power of the voltage. You know, and you should really check that out. The reason why is because cortic voltage scaling is not a natural process. It's a consequence of the mass fluctuation effect going as the power, which is V squared, and the rectifying force produced by the second harmonic mechanical signal produced by electrostriction, which you saw in those waveforms, also goes as the square of the voltage. So the combination of the two is cortic voltage scaling. And in fact, that's indeed what you find. But I'm going to show you this. This is a chirp movie. What you will see is the signal come on and there's almost no thrust. That's because it's a few kilohertz above the res resonant frequency. You will then see it sweep smoothly through the resonance and you'll see the thing go negative and then positive and then it switches off and you get an off switching transient. And the initial ones are not big, but as thermal conditions evolve in the system, wait and see what happens at the end. Here we go. And you get sound with this one because I did it with my camera. This was before Heidi figured out how to capture stuff. It's not showing anything. Oh, God. It works on my machine. There we are. Okay. First, first sweep. It hits a resonance. Switches off. By the way, full scale on this is 12 and a half micronewtons. Okay, hits a resonance, switches off. On again, no thrust response, hits a resonance, switches off. This is the future of space transportation because you can do this repeatedly. There you're looking at something that's like six, six micronewtons in that last one. And you can see gradual thermal drift to low, what appears to be lower thrusts. You know. Uh, actually, it turns out the heating problem, as I've said, is not in the device itself. The devices will probably turn out to be relatively easy to cool because they don't generate much heat. What you want, as I say, is really high-Q devices, so they sit there and wiggle like mad, and you want to mount them in such a way that you're either at a node or you manage to isolate it with a rubber pad or what have you from the high frequency isolation. Years ago when you get overheating, you were breaking up the PZTs. Oh yeah, back when I was using EC5, EC65 crystals many years ago, yes, you could snap the bolts with them too, okay? Wow. Yes, and they heated up a lot more. The dissipation in EC65 is about 10 times the dissipation in SM111. 
which is why I chose SM111, low dissipation. Okay. And I can run it again for you if you want in the background as we have questions. You know, it's one of my. It's because the device actually is heating up, not as much as we thought, but as it heats up, basically as it heats up, the tuning of the Q with the preload on the stack changes slightly, and you get a bigger effect. And it's, you know, again, one of those things that you blunder onto. Uh, so, uh, these are two devices? No, this is the same device that Martin used, believe it or not. <coughs> this is one device. It's already a little bit degraded. And the presentation, which I'm not going to be able to show you because I've only got 40 seconds left, okay, there's a picture of one of these runs when it was really working well, and there you see on the order of 10 to 12 micronewtons as a thrust in one of these heated up th events. How long is it going to take you? 22 seconds. <laughs> Go for it. It's, it'll, no, that's what your clock tells me I have left. Okay. Just a question between, do you use new metal sheeting as your Faraday cage? Yeah. Why did I do that? So that paranoid skeptics would be satisfied that there was some <laughs> serious magnetic shielding. Okay. In fact, it turns out that these things don't produce electromagnetic signatures that are a serious problem of interacting with other stuff. Heidi will show you. When Heidi shows you the stuff on the dual drive, what you'll see is a big thermal signature, and it's because power cords are expanding and they are not constrained by the Faraday cage and is producing shift in the mass distribution on the balance. And what you'll see is a thermal signature that drives the whole signal that you're generating up and then it cools off. Okay, but that's, that's her talk. So it's I'm, new metal sheeting. New metal sheeting. 